And we're going to be moving in now to a talk called The Anchor, which is all about being able to stand firm when the storms of life buffet us. But before I get into that talk, I want to go back a little bit and recap where we've been coming from. So we've been in the book of Hebrews, and we're remembering that the Hebrews were a group of urban Christians in a pluralistic society, not unlike ours, that were dealing with a lot of persecution, a lot of suffering as a result of their faith. So because they were looking at life through a certain lens, which was not like the lens of the culture, they were being marginalized, and they were really suffering. And so what we really wanted to do with that first talk was set the stage that Jesus is worth that that his greatness and his all-sufficiency is such that when we suffer, there is meaning in it, and he is always worth whatever we might suffer because of our faith in him. And the author of Hebrews goes on to continue to talk to specific issues that these suffering Christians are experiencing. And we honed in this morning on rest and on the need, um, the need for that in our lives. And what the temptation was that the author of Hebrews was addressing with the Hebrews was to run back to the old way of doing things. And so they were tempted. It would be so much easier if they just went back to doing things the old way, the way that it had been done all throughout the Old Testament, the, the pre-Jesus way of worshiping God, because then they wouldn't be marginalized quite to the degree that they were. And so when the author is calling them towards rest, it's also saying, don't go back there. There is something better for you here now. And it's, it's rest, it's Sabbath rest, it's Canaan rest, it's soul rest. And so now as we're moving forward into the book, we're going to now take a look at hope and how hope is an anchor for our soul, which most definitely was something that the Hebrew people needed. You know, we don't really need hope when everything is going well, Right? But when we're suffering, that's when we need something that gets us through those days. So when he started talking and started writing about hope, he had their attention because hope was very much something that they were in desperate need of. So I want to open us up again in prayer before we dive into this talk on the anchor in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God, we do stand firmly entirely because of you, because of who you are and what you have done for us. And so as we get into this talk about hope, we're going to end up moving into the subject of suffering because that's when we most need hope, is in those times and in those seasons. And I just ask for a special grace for me as I'm speaking today because as we get into subjects that um, are close to home for me and are close to home for all of us, we just pray, God, that you would just be a balm on our hearts and that as um, perhaps we'd be putting our fingers a little bit on some areas of life that maybe feel a little vulnerable or feel a little bit raw, that we would know that you meet us there tenderly and patiently. And so what I ask for the grace for right now is that we would just open up our hearts to you, that we would expose them to you, and that you would open our ears and open our eyes to hear whatever specific message your spirit would have for each one of us today. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. So the setting was Vienna, Austria, and there were three psychiatrists there that were working together. It was during the period leading up to World War II, and what they were doing is they were trying to figure out what is the meaning of life, what makes people tick, what motivates their behavior. There were two experts, and there was one apprentice. The experts were Sigmund Freud and Alfred Adler, and the apprentice was a man named Viktor Frankl, who was very much observing and learning from these two mentors. So Sigmund Freud's research led him to the conclusion that what really drove man, what was really the motivating factor in man's life was the pursuit of pleasure. That's what caused man to do what he did. It would explain the choices that were made and the things that people were willing to endure. All of that was very much motivated by a desire, a drive for pleasure. The second expert was Alfred Adler, and his study of human behavior led him to a very different conclusion. And what he believed was really motivating our behavior was not so much a drive for pleasure as it was a drive 
for power. And he believed that deep within us all is a strong desire to control. And that desire to control was what was informing our choices and changing our behavior, how we lived. The third man was Viktor Frankl. And he had hoped to follow in the footsteps of his mentors. But then World War II came and everything changed. And no longer could Jewish psychiatrists study and do research in the way that they had. That invasion of the, na of the Nazis caught everything short. Now the two experts, Freud and Adler, were well enough known that they were able to escape, they were able to get out of Austria, but Viktor Frankl, as a mere apprentice, didn't have those kind of connections. And he ended up having to go to a concentration camp where he remained for four years. When he was there, he did survive the war. He went back to his career. And he went back to those same questions. He revisited them, looking at those, what, what the experience he had just had, his time as a prisoner, and how that was impacting the way he saw all those very same pieces of research. And so he went back to what Freud had said and went back to what Adler had said. And what he was reflecting on during his time as a prisoner was that the people who survived were not the ones you would have expected. Like you would have thought the really physically strong ones would have been the ones that would have survived to the end. But very often it was ones who were physically very weak, who were still there at the end of the war. And this puzzled Frankel. He wanted to know why was it. So he first looked to the research of Freud and said, was it something to do with that inner drive for pleasure? And then he thought about those years in the concentration camp. He said, certainly not. There, there was no pleasure. It was utterly devoid of pleasure. There was only pain. There was only suffering. There was only mistreatment. Pleasure could not have been what was motivating them to survive. So then he turned to the research of Adler. And he thought about Adler's belief that it was really a desire for power that was motivating behavior. And he thought, well, there again, that argument totally just loses ground in the concentration camp because they had anything but power. They were treated like animals. They were absolutely without any rights whatsoever. At any given moment, someone could say, you're dying, and they would be dead. Power could not have been, in, by any stretch of the imagination, what was causing them to be able to survive and continue on. So Viktor Frankl came up with his own theory. And what he believed was the one absolutely critical thing that the survivors all possessed was hope. They all were able to hold on to hope throughout those years there and never lost sight of the fact that their lives even in the most dire circumstances, continue to have meaning. Despite the fact that everything felt out of control, everything felt never-ending, their lives did contain meaning each and every day. And Frankl determined that this was the one thing that gives life true value. So this was what their hope was rooted in. The survivor's hope was rooted in the fact that life has meaning and this is something that is so beyond wishful thinking. You know, we use the word hope in a lot of different ways, don't we? I hope the weather is nice tomorrow. I hope I do well on that exam. I hope my kids win their basketball game. You know, we use it as if just it's a form of positive thinking. But what is being talked about here, biblical hope, goes so much deeper than that. Biblical hope is gritty. It's steadfast. In the words of G.K. Chesterton, hope means hoping when things are hopeless, or it's no virtue at all. As long as matters are really hopeful, hope is actually merely flattery or platitude. It is only when everything is hopeless that hope begins to be a strength. And this is the kind of hope that the Hebrews needed in their set of circumstances. It's not based on luck. It's not based on fingers crossed. Our hope is based on the trustworthiness of God. It's based on God's promises and his impeccable track record of always, always, always following through on what he has said. Our hope, our hope is rooted, it is anchored in the promises of God. So I want you to open up your Bibles with me to chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to take a look at verse 19 and verse 20. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, 
firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where Jesus who went before us has entered on our behalf. Our anchor. My husband's favorite thing to do is to go boating, and it's the favorite thing really of his whole family. And so this is something when we all get together that invariably we're going to all be going out on the boat. And what they like to do is they like to go out first thing in the morning, and they like to stay out till the very, very end of the day. And I love all of this in theory. Here's what I really like about it. I really love the photo ops. I love the nautical colors. I love it when we all dress in colors that match the boat. And I love the beautiful sea in the background. Here's what I don't like. I get super seasick. And I'm the only one in the whole bunch, my own children included, who get seasick. So I remember in the early days, we first went out in this boat. And what they would say is, you know, we're, we're going out now, we're moving now, but then we're going to drop anchor. And that's just going to be great. And we're going to just sit, and we're going to fish, and we're going to hang. And I remember, like, as we were going in the boat, just thinking about that anchor. And I'm like, when that anchor drops, it's going to be so awesome. Because I'm not going to feel sick anymore. It's going to just settle everything for me. And so I watched this huge anchor going down. I'm like, I love that anchor. Like, I literally walked up to the front of the boat to watch it going down just to see it. And, you know, an interesting thing happened. You know, we didn't drift. We didn't go anywhere. But then we just started to rock. You know, the anchor actually doesn't prevent you from rocking it. It does two things. It prevents you from drifting off course, and it prevents you from being totally derailed in a storm. But you actually do keep rocking. In fact, the existence of an anchor actually is proof that there's going to be rocking. There's going to be something that we need to be held firm in the midst of. It's kind of a guarantee that storms do come. That's why you have to have the anchor on the boat. And so we're not promised that there aren't going to be storms. We're not promised that because we have this anchor as a hope for our soul that it's always going to be smooth sailing. We're promised actually the opposite. But what we know and we can count on is that this anchor will hold us steady and will keep us safe. In his work as a licensed psychologist and a marriage, family, and child counselor, Dr. James Dobson has done a lot of studying on the way in which we react to suffering, the impact of suffering specifically on people's faith. And he has this to say about what causes the most crushing circumstances when we go through periods of suffering. And it's this, he says, it's an incorrect view of scripture to say that we're gonna always comprehend what God is doing and how our suffering and disappointment fit into his plan. Sooner or later, all of us are gonna come to a point where it appears that God has lost control or interest in the affairs of people. It's only an illusion, but one with dangerous implications for spiritual and mental health. And interestingly enough, and I think this is such an important point, pain and suffering do not cause the greatest damage. Confusion is a factor that shreds people's faith. The human spirit is actually capable of enduring great discomfort, including the prospect of death, if the circumstances make sense. And you know, the Hebrews were having trouble making sense of their circumstances. They were asking that question, remember, if we are following you, God, if we are doing what you're saying we're supposed to be doing, then why is this so hard? And we ask the same question. And just in our day-to-day -day lives as we suffer, we want to know what is the meaning, what is the point behind this, why have you allowed this, God? And we can answer the cry of the human heart by pointing out that in heaven it's going to all make sense. That here we only see a little bit of reality. That here we see the underneath of the tapestry and one day it will be turned over in heaven and we can see the beauty of the story that God has been writing. We can say that we do not have the mind of God. So there's no way we're going to really understand everything that happens, everything that intersects our lives. And both these things are absolutely true and trustworthy. But I'll be honest. When I'm really suffering, they leave me a little bit dissatisfied. I need something more in that moment to help me to keep walking. That is enough for me to just sit still for a bit. But if I'm going to keep walking towards my calling, I need something more. 
And that something more is what we are going to talk about today, because I want to spend the rest of this time talking about hope, hope that we can find in struggle. We read in Romans 5, verse 2, that the hope of the Christian is the glory of God. The hope of the Christian is the glory of God. And that is a humbling reminder of why it is that we are here. We are here for the express purpose of bringing glory to God. But there are a lot of other potential purposes that war for that place of importance in our hearts. So God says, I created you to bring me glory. And we say, oh, um, I would like to think that I was created in order to be fulfilled and in order to be happy. Or when we're feeling altruistic, we might say, well, I would like to believe that I was created with gifts and talents that I meant to give out and to change the world. Now, there is truth in both those things. And so it's very easy for us to miss out on the true purpose of our lives because when we live pursuing one of those two things, there's enough truth to it that it does keep us going. But it's missing something really important because, okay, yes, we are God's daughters. Yes, he does want us to be fulfilled and to be happy. And yes, he has, has placed spiritual gifts in each and every one of us that he wants us to use to bring change and good to our world. But first things first. Our number one priority is to bring glory to God. And we do that by knowing him, by loving him, by being transformed so that we become more like him. That brings glory to God. So how do we do that? How do we become more like Christ? How is that even possible? The answer is found in Colossians 1, verse 27. It's a short verse. Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is because Christ has taken up residence in us through the Holy Spirit that we can live in this way, that we can live in such a way that brings God happiness and brings us fulfillment and satisfaction and allows us to use our gifts for him to change the world for the better. And we can do all of these things even in times of extreme suffering. I recently read a quote by St. Augustine it really caused me to ponder some things in a new way. This is the quote. He wrote, in my deepest wound, I saw your glory, and it dazzled me. In my deepest wound, I saw your glory, and it dazzled me. Few people have examined the human heart with the intensity of St. Augustine. And what this quote is telling us is that in his heart, there was a place of woundedness that went beyond, you hurt my feelings. I'm a little bit offended. It went deeper than that. It was something raw. It was something vulnerable. And it was in that place that St. Augustine saw God's glory. And there's some really deep truth here that I want to delve in and unpack because I think contained in it, I think if we can grasp what he is getting at. We will look at our suffering in a whole new way. Because we all have wounds. We all have places in our life where there has been suffering, where people have hurt us, perhaps intentionally, perhaps unintentionally, and we carry those through life. Nobody gets through life unscathed in this way. And the truth is there are places in each one of us that feel raw, where hurt still remains, where our emotions don't feel entirely under our control. And we don't like what that feels like. We don't like that when our emotions are a little askew and unsettled. And so we determine that we are going to make sure that whatever caused that hurt is never going to happen again. And we figure out, how are we going to protect ourselves going forward? What kind of behaviors are going to keep us from being hurt? And all these emotions swirl in the midst of it all, and we have a really tough time making sense of our pain. In those places in our heart where we are most wounded, those are the places where we are also 
the most susceptible to lies. And the enemy of our soul loves this. He loves to enter into those places of confusion and unrest and stir up the pot. That is his favorite. Because he knows that when we're in that place, when we feel knocked off our chair emotionally, that we're going to be especially susceptible to very specific lies. And those are lies about our identity. And when he can get us there, when he can get us believing a lie about our identity, he has got us in the palm of his hand. Because knowing who we are in Christ is so absolutely critical. Because if he can get us to start questioning who we are and what we are worth, it's just a couple steps over before we are starting to question the trustworthiness of God. And he knows that if he can get us to mess, if he can mess with our trust in the promises of God, then what he can do is he can take away our hope. And he can take us out at the knees, and that brings us to this point where we're just flat on the floor or just sitting in the chair, and he's like, thank heavens, that's one less woman that I have got to worry about. He loves it when he saps us of hope. The enemy of your soul wants you to question two core truths. And so these are two truths that you have got to always keep at the forefront of your mind and protect. These are thoughts when you feel something in your life is making war against one of those two truths, then that's a lie and it needs to go. And you need to ground yourself in these truths. The first is that you are a beloved daughter of God. And the second is that there is nothing you can do to earn or to lose God's love. Those are two critical, critical truths. And the enemy of your soul wants you to question them both. So when you feel wounded, he sets to work. And he gets to, or at least tries to get you to question God's promises, to question God's provision, to ask questions like, where was God? What kind of a father is God if he would let this happen? Why didn't he step in? If he really loves me, wouldn't he have prevented that from happening? And he whispers these kinds of questions to us outside in, right? Where's the Holy Spirit? In. Speaking truth from within. But outside in, the enemy whispers lies. So he whispers it in, and oh, he just loves it when they take lodge, when they take root. When we grab a hold of it, we start chewing on it. And we start thinking about it. And when we are experiencing deep pain, these are some of the lies that begin to run through our minds. I'm all alone. I'm abandoned. There's something wrong with me. This is my fault. I'm not safe. Trusting again would be unbearable. I'm not loved. I'm unwanted. I'm insignificant. There's no hope. Nothing is ever going to change. Do you know each one of those lies is a direct attack on your identity? And if even just one of those lies take root, then what you will very often do is move into the mode of self-protection, of figuring out how you're going to make sure this never happens again. It, breaks, it puts us right into that mode of self-reliance. And more often than not, it leads us to sin. Because we get to this point where we're like, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. So that does not happen again. And it can cause us to make choices that aren't always the best ones. We want to avoid suffering, right? We want to avoid those circumstances that lead us to those places. We want to avoid anything that triggers a wound from our past. And so we often step into behaviors that we think will help us avoid things getting worse. This is our natural human tendency, but we have a choice. We do not need to live out of our woundedness. We can live out of our identity as beloved daughters of God. Now, obviously, all wounds are not equal in intensity. And so what I'm going to start talking about are some things that have really helped me in my area of woundedness. But I just want to acknowledge 
that in this room there is suffering that goes far, far beyond the path that I have walked. And so I acknowledge the sacredness of that space. And I want to say that in order to see God's glory in our wounds and be dazzled by it, it's going to require some deep soul work. And that takes time. And that often takes the help of a professional. And so what I'm going to say here today is not going to be some quick fix. The fact that I've shared these thoughts is not going to make you go, well, isn't this great? Because now I have a total grasp on suffering going forward. But what my prayer is, is that maybe you will have a paradigm shift today. Maybe you will start to see a purpose in your suffering, a redemptiveness to your suffering that you had not seen before. And that you might begin to think or to be open to the fact that perhaps God is calling you to take some time to look at those wounds, to peel back those layers, to put some space in your calendar so that you can maybe get a little bit of help to take these steps towards freedom. And one thing I can promise you is that the miracle is always worth the mess. The miracle is always worth the mess. And there does tend to always be some mess on the way towards healing. It is not a clean process. That is unquestionably what occurs when God plums the depths of his heart and starts to reveal to us what is really below the surface. It gets messy. It's, it's an imperfect process. But there is a miracle of healing that comes on the other side. So how does this work in real life? You know, we had talked in Hebrews 4 about how God can use his words spoken and just his word in our life for something to be exposed, something to be laid bare. And very often, the way in which he alerts us to the fact that there is something going on below the surface is actually with physical symptoms. You know, perhaps it's a headache, reoccurring headaches, perhaps it's an upset stomach, sweaty palms, panic attacks, anxiety. All these things are indicating to us there is something more going on here, and God wants us to pay attention and to be alerted that we are not feeling peace and hope-filled. This is something that is worth pausing over and to plumb the depths of it a little bit. And so for me, that something physical tends to be headaches, really bad headaches, um, oftentimes you know, migraines and really upset stomachs. Okay? So, and the funny thing is, I never seem to connect it with something emotional. And that's the gift of my husband in my life, because I'll start to say how I'm feeling, and I'm like, oh, I'm sure I'm coming down with the flu. And he's like, you don't have the flu. I'm like, we haven't even heard all my symptoms. He's like, this is so clockwork. He goes, no, he goes, you're upset. You're upset, or he'll say, you're nervous. And the more I'll think about it, I'll be like, oh, you're right. That is what's going on. So it's an alert to us. So for me, this is just an example. I was at a speaking event some time ago. And I had gone there, and I so wanted to do well. I wanted to do well for the women who had organized the event. They were really precious, and I, I loved them so much. And I was the first speaker that night. And I got up onto the stage, and I realized, and it had all kicked off, that I would left my glasses at the table. And I was just kind of new to needing to wear readers, so it wasn't a part of my just like natural deal. So they were there. The lighting was very dim up on the stage, and I realized I could see nothing. I could not see my notes. I could not see my Bible. And so I thought, well, I'm just going to roll with it. Well, it wasn't long into the talk where I realized that probably wasn't a good idea. I should have just said, you know what, hold on, everybody. I've got to go get my glasses. Nobody would have cared. But I'd gone far enough in that it seemed very odd. So I kept going. And the floor was super creaky, and I was super distracted. And by the end of it, I just felt like I had done a really, really crummy job. And I kind of carried that all weekend long, just feeling like, um, boy, I'd really wanted to be perfect. Like, I'd really wanted to nail it. And that was maybe like a C minus. That's, that's what it felt like. So went through the weekend, and um, as we were beginning, close to the end of packing up, I started to get one of my really horrible migraines. And um, I just figured I was tired or getting sick or who knows what. And as we were driving home, there was a beautiful woman sitting behind me who has the gift of intercessory prayer. And she insisted that I recline my chair all the way back and that she you know, would start to like massage and rub my shoulders. And I'm not joking when I say that she massaged and rubbed my shoulders and my head for a full hour. What a beautiful gift of mercy. And as she was doing that, and I was relaxing a little bit, but the headache was not abating, but the massage was feeling good, 
She leaned forward and she whispered in my ear, are you beating yourself up about something? And I started to bawl. Super embarrassing and highly inappropriate. <laughs> Car full of people. I'm like, <laughs> and she said, um, she's like, I don't know what that's about. She's like, I don't know what you're beating yourself up. And she put her hand right on my heart as she was talking. And she's like, that's not from the Lord. That's not from the Lord. And she said, I want you to identify what you're beating yourself up about. She's like whispering all this to me in the car. And she said, and I want you to describe just in your head the feeling. Identify the emotion. What is it? And so I did. And then she said, I want you to think of the first time you remember feeling that really acutely. And I started to pray, and I'm sure she was praying. Um, and a very strong memory came to my mind. And it was of a time when I was first married. And I was going to a gathering with a group of people who were really important to my husband. And I was a new bride, and it was really, really, really important to me that they like me and that I be accepted and that I belong. And, and that's not an easy thing when you're in another culture. I was an American coming in, and so already you've got a little bit going against you when you've got a language barrier and just a cultural barrier. But I so, so, so wanted to belong. And something happened in that weekend, it was a weekend event, that delivered about as strong a message as I have ever received with very, very specific words that I did not belong, that I did not fit in, that there was a code of behavior, and I had sure as heck better figure it out if I wanted to survive here. And that was a pivotal moment in my life where I made a decision which has had long-reaching consequences, where I thought in that moment, survival. I do not ever, ever want to feel this again. So I'm going to figure out that rule book. And I'm going to figure out how it is that I'm supposed to behave perfectly in this place. And I am going to do it. So as I was praying through this, the woman then whispered in my ears. She said, as you think of that time, can you hear a lie? Do you see a lie, an attack on your identity that took place then? And I could. I certainly could. And she said that was the voice of the enemy. She said, but do you know who else was there? The Lord. And I want you to picture your face as a young girl. What did he see in your face? How do you think he was looking at you in that situation? And it was such a healing exercise to be reminded that he was there with a whole different perspective on the situation. He had a whole different message that he wanted to impart to me. But who was I listening to? the people in the room whose opinion mattered so very much to me. So she challenged me, go to that truth, cling to that truth, and when those memories come, go back to what God would speak to you in that moment. And um, God shared a very personal word with me, which it's, it's just a between me and him word, really. But all I need to do is say that word, and I feel freedom, and I feel a dispelling of the enemy's lies, because God can speak to our hearts in such a really beautiful and personal way. And the headache abated almost immediately. So practically speaking, what was going on there when I was going through that exercise of prayer? I was following a thread. Okay? I was starting at a certain point, and I was allowing God to take me on a journey where I was following a thread back, and so this is something that we can all do in a lot of circumstances. And it's a prayerful process. But when something alerts us that something's going wrong, we're feeling something physical, or you know what, maybe it's something emotional. We've had an outburst, a reaction to another person that we know ourselves. That was a little stronger than was really called for. And it's because there's something else going on below the surface. We can stop. And first of all, what we want to do is we want to identify that emotion. Name it. What is it? Is it anger? Is it fear? 
Is it grief? Is it a sense of loss? Is it a feeling of betrayal? Is it a sense of having been abandoned? I don't know what it would, I mean, there's a myriad of things that we could feel, but take the time to really identify it, and you'll know. When you hit the word, you'll be like, that's close, no, that's it, no, that's it. It's fear, or it's anger, or whatever, whatever it is. Then what you want to say is, okay, what event triggered this emotion? Like, what just happened to me that I am feeling the strong emotion about? Identify that. And then follow that thread a little further back and say, when did I first feel that emotion in this way? That could be a childhood memory. could be an adulthood memory. Let, let the Lord lead you to that point of, of another time in which you felt that emotion. And then when you follow that back, can you see a trigger? Can you see something that happened then that then gets repeatedly triggered in your life in other circumstances, and then the emotion that you feel, it's not just the emotion of that moment. It's all of these other emotions that are carried with it, which gives it that intensity and gives it that power. Okay? And as God reveals what is going on below the surface, follow that thread back and see if you can find any lies that were spoken against your identity at that time. And even now. So I want to go back to what those are, some of the lies that are associated, that are an attack on identity. I am alone. I'm all alone. I'm abandoned. There's something wrong with me. This is all my fault. It's all up to me. I'm not safe. Trusting again would be unbearable. I'm not loved. I'm not wanted. I'm insignificant. All of these are lies. All of these are lies. If that is the thought you had at that time, that is a lie. And then ask God to counter it with his truth. Invite him into that memory and say, speak truth. Speak your healing truth into that memory. How did you see me in that moment when I felt unloved, rejected, that I didn't belong, not enough, insignificant? How did you see me as your beloved daughter in that moment? Because God wants to speak truth into those places in your heart where lies have taken hold. That is where he wants to set you free. That's that place that he wants to expose and lay bare so he can go there with the healing presence of the balm of the Spirit and bring healing. And as he begins to heal you in those places of your woundedness, what are you going to see? You're going to see his glory. That's what St. Augustine was talking about. Because in that place of woundedness, when he meets us there, glory, glory. You know, there is no one safer than Jesus to invite into those tender places of your heart. He understands your pain completely. He has experienced it. No one has suffered more intensely than Jesus. No one. We know the passage from Isaiah 53 where we read, He was spurred and avoided by men, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity. One of those from whom men hid their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as stricken, as one smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole, and by his stripes we were healed. But far from being senseless, Jesus' suffering was replete with meaning. The cross is what makes every promise that we can claim come to pass. We are never alone, not even in our suffering, because Jesus knows and understands and never leaves us. He can redeem even the most broken and dark and desperate situation, because he has conquered death. He has experienced the worst of everything we can imagine. Wounds, it's all mentioned in that passage in Isaiah. Wounds, sufferings, offenses offenses, guilt, sin, death, all those things that we dread. He experienced all of it. And he has redeemed all of it. 
I know of no one who explains redemptive suffering better than Dr. Bob Schutz. He's the founder of the JP2 Healing Institute in Tallahassee, Florida, and that man has taught me a great deal, a great deal about redemptive suffering. And he describes Jesus' suffering in this way. Abandonment. Jesus experienced abandonment by his friends and by God. Do you feel abandoned? Jesus, is a, he understands completely that feeling. Shame. Do you struggle with shame? Think of how Jesus was publicly condemned and humiliated. Fear. Jesus faced the fear of death, violence, rejection, and abandonment. When we're in the grip of fear, he knows. He gets it. Powerlessness. Jesus willingly submitted to powerlessness on the cross. Rejection. Jesus faced, was despised and rejected by the people. Hopelessness. Jesus faced his death on the cross without giving in to despair. I think that's amazing. Confusion. Jesus' identity was totally confounded in the public eye. Think about, think about all the attacks on Jesus' identity when you look at the Passion. Look at the Passion with kind of a fresh lens, just on your own. It would be a great thing to meditate on. And think about how much lie was being disputed him about who he was. If you are who you say you are, then this, that, or the other. But in the face of total confusion, he never lost sight of his identity, of who he was. And Dr. Bob Schutz goes on to say that Jesus left us an example of how to suffer without sin and without losing our identity. And this is huge. This is huge for us. Because we have to figure out what can keep us back from our calling, right? I mean, we're, we're here because we want to love and serve Christ with all that we have. And suffering intersects our lives, and we want to quit. We want to, we want to pull back. We want to pull the covers over our heads. But we need something that allows us, in the face of suffering, to continue to walk towards our calling. And Jesus gives us the perfect example in this, because as he walked towards his calling, every step was intensifying his suffering. It was getting worse not better, the more that he obeyed as he walked toward the cross. But what allowed him to do that is he knew who he was, he knew what his purpose was, and he knew the meaning of life. He knew that there was a grand narrative, a great story that made sense of everything in the world, of where we came from, why we are here, where we are going, and he knew he was the linchpin to the whole thing. He knew there was purpose in his suffering, and he never lost sight of that purpose, or of his identity. So instead of hiding, or running away, or self-protecting, Jesus chose to walk forward, to love, to trust. He didn't isolate himself. And with every step of his passion, what he was doing was redeeming suffering. And this has meant so much to me in this recent season of my life. Um, for a year, I would say that one difficulty is simply piled on the next. I've felt shredded emotionally, and fear has really had me in its grip. I felt it in my own heart as I've walked through this process I've described where God started opening up some wounds in my heart that I just did not want to look at. I didn't want to revisit. I didn't want to go there. I didn't want to pause and take the time to do the work of healing. I felt it in my family as I suffered alongside a child in the most intense way I could imagine. I felt it in my marriage as God began to heal communication patterns between Leo and I that were very, very well worn. Paths that we had gotten really comfortable in but were, were not the best. We're not going to bring us to these next 25 years of marriage communicating better and growing closer. And so as we started to learn how to communicate better with each other, we had to learn how to dance again. And you know, when you're learning how to dance again, do you know what you do? You step on each other's toes all the time. And it was hard. And, and it still is hard. We're still, we're still learning this. Um, but I am seeing Miracle in the Mess. It is worth it. And I felt it acutely in ministry. There was a three-month period of such, such fierce attack and, and difficulty 
in ministry that my stress level reached an all-time high. And during that time, I woke up one morning and I couldn't really hear out of my right ear. And, you know, I was told that it was triggered by stress. It was just an intense ringing that I couldn't get rid of. And I very often just had to go into a room by myself and put the sound machine on because I just couldn't even bear the sound of laughter because it was just magnified and piercing. And I felt like I was going crazy. And I'll tell you what I wanted to do at that time. I wanted to run. I wanted to hide. I wanted to self-protect. And I really, really, really wanted to quit. I wanted to stop running this race because it's costly. And I think you know what I'm talking about because it's costly for you too. And then I looked at Jesus. And I was so struck by the way in which he continued to walk towards his calling with pain intensifying, not lessening. And I thought about the fact that on the cross, he carried my burdens, my offenses, my iniquities. And then I looked down at my hands, and I realized I was carrying them too. And we don't both need to carry it. And I wasn't strong enough. And I was going under. And so I took all of that, and I just threw it at the foot of the cross. And I locked up our office, and I went on sabbatical. <laughs> and I asked the Lord to heal me in the deepest of ways. And I asked him to teach me in this time of sabbatical to learn how to suffer without losing my identity. And I asked him to teach me how to continue to walk towards my calling when I was so afraid and so tired. And I asked him to help me to continue to trust even when my heart had been so hurt. And you know, it was not an instant fix. Things got messier. Things got worse. That's kind of the deal. That's kind of how this works. That's how healing goes. It's, it's not a five-step program. It's a process where we make some mistakes, but we try to move forward towards healing to help us clarify how we can suffer purely. But what is being reborn in me? is the ability to rest in the knowledge that I am God's beloved daughter. And that is enough. And that it is okay when things break when I drop them at his feet. Because sometimes that's what's needed. So he can pick those pieces up and create something so much more beautiful than what I had been working on in his perfect timing. And, I, and I'm learning to respect my limits because surprise, surprise, I am not very good at being God. <laughs> He's teaching me all these things, and, and because of it, I have hope. I have hope that even when my suffering just feels like it's crowding in on me and makes me feel like my life is in disarray, I have hope that what is actually going on is that God is creating order in something very, very beautiful. And I look at my wounds, and I see his glory. I really do. I see his all-sufficiency. I see his love for me and that there is nothing I can do to change that or to earn that. What a precious gift. Because of that, I can say that the sufferings of this present time aren't worth comparing with the glory that is yet to be revealed. So let's cling to our anchor in times of suffering. Let's suffer purely. Let's not allow attack on our identity to keep us from walking towards our calling, regardless of our circumstances, because we have an anchor who promises that he will hold us firm, even when everything around us seems to just be falling to pieces. He holds us in his hands, and he will never 
ever let us go. Will you pray with me, please? Dear Lord God, thank you for being an, our anchor in the midst of the storms of life. We acknowledge that you don't stop the rocking of the boat, but you do hold us steady in your love. May we stay there, and may you, Holy Spirit, be our teacher. May you go to those places within us that need your touch and bring your healing power so that in our deepest wounds we might see your glory. Amen.